Do you know who Karl Barth is? Have you heard of who that is? The European? Uh, Karl Barth is a, a 20th century theologian. Um, that's his picture. It's a, a picture from Time magazine. He doesn't always look that grim, uh, <laughs> actually. Uh, uh, but that is, uh, you know, for, for, the, for general population, that is one of his most famous quotes. Take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret the newspaper with your Bible. And he said it we think many times, but um, he thought it was very important for people to be informed about the world's events, uh, but always to interpret the world's events through scripture. Well, um, I like that. I, I made a, a bit of an effort to catch up lately with what's happening in the world. Have you done that? Well, if you haven't noticed, how could you not have noticed? But uh, did you know that there's a presidential election going on? <laughs> sure you did. Of course you did. <laughs> now, I, I know that there have been uglier campaigns in American history. As a matter of fact, I, I happen to know that George Washington actually didn't want to run for a second term because uh, he hated politics and the ugliness of politics. I don't know if you knew that, but it's true. Imagine that. Yeah. First election, our first president didn't want to run for a second term because, and he was running undefeated, I think. Unopposed. I but anyway, uh, I, I know that there have been uglier politics, but in my lifetime, I'm, I'm really not sure I remember a stranger or, or more difficult campaign than this one in my lifetime. I don't know about any of you. Um, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating journey to the White House. And yet, one of these folks is actually, at the end of all of it, going to be sworn in as the next president of the United States. One of, them. One of these candidates will move to Washington, D.C. and be there for at least four years as the commander-in-chief. Imagine that. And, and as you're sitting there, some of you may be saying, yes, I'm so glad about it. And others of you may be saying, oh my gosh, I can't, I don't even want that to happen. I don't know. And I don't talk politics here. That's not my job. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just making a point about... Christians and interpreting the Bible to them. But do you try to keep your politics separate from your faith? That's really my point. Or do you, as Karl Barth recommends, uh, use your scripture to shape your opinions and viewpoints? Do you use what you know here to uh, filter, to evaluate, to, um, to think about what happens. Because we can't have one life out there and one life in here. We need to be authentic. We need to be one person here and there. Things need to stand up in light of this. That's important. Jesus is our model for who we are to be in this world. And of course, it's interesting to note that most people fail to realize how politically savvy Jesus was. You know, politics is supposed to be like a dirty word, but Jesus was an excellent politician, which only means to understand deeply how people work to understand the motives of human beings. Jesus understood them well. He wasn't naive. In his own time, his capacity for understanding the complex politics of his world was greatly underestimated. And I suppose that was normal. Um, did I, if I, Jim, 
help me on this one. If I ever uh, go past one of those little um, sheep cartoons, let me know, because I, I didn't mark where they are, but they're funny, okay? okay. All of you can help, too. I, I stuck them in because they're funny, but I didn't mark them in my answer. It, um, so most folks, particularly Jesus' Emmys, knew him only as the uneducated son of a carpenter from Nazareth, which was a backwater village in Galilee, which was a discarded third-rate region in Israel. Boy, you can't get much farther down than that, you know. There, you got no stars for being from Nazareth in Galilee. Um, so what kind of political sophistication could Jesus have had, according to any of his uh, enemies? Well, Herod Antipas, A-N-T-I-P-A-S, Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, had been given power by Rome. There's some of his coins. You probably can't see very well, but you didn't get to make coins with your picture on them unless you were pretty powerful in those days. Um, and he had been given one-fourth of Israel to control. Um, that's why he was called a tetrarch, <coughs> one-fourth of Israel to control. And that portion included Galilee and the Red Sea. Um, that's uh, the Dead Sea, excuse me. That's 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 it right there. The, the, right, I think I'm saying all these things right. Okay. Um, yeah. And let's go to the next slide, and I'll show you um, this town right up here. I can't reach it, but you see some Sephoris up here and Tiberias. Yeah. Those are the two towns that uh, he built. Herod that Herod built. And uh, that's the Sea of Galilee right there. And um, those two towns, Herod built them, they were like Roman uh, resorts. He built them to look for all the world like beautiful Roman resorts. And in the, in the Bible, those are two cities that Jesus never sets foot in. You can't find a sighting that Jesus ever went there. Oh, gee, thank you. So, uh, Jesus doesn't seem to be too worried about Herod. And the other sheep says, Herod is nothing. And then the, the sheep says, the real threat lies among the people Jesus had come to save. Jesus isn't worried about Herod. He's worried about the people. You can, you can think ahead to the crucifixion scenes if you want to. And, and then here's the joke. The first sheep said, seriously, who is doing his market research? <laughs> that brings the politics back into it. So in the days and weeks before our lesson takes place, Jesus had been in Galilee healing and preaching his upside down message of the kingdom. And Jesus had been shaking things up, talking about of justice and caring for the poor and God's compassion and concern for the least. You know, all of those crazy wackadoodle things that Jesus talks about. And most of all, Jesus' very clear message that the last should be first and the first should be last. And it didn't go over very well then and it doesn't go over very well now. It's still not very popular. And some Pharisees arrive just in time to hear this message being spoken again. And they tell Jesus that Herod's, Herod has plans to do him harm. Well, that sounds nice, doesn't it? So what do you think? Are these the nice Pharisees? They, they are not his friends. They are not helping him. They are hoping, however, that Jesus will believe them. Yeah, them. They are hoping that Jesus will say, thank you so much for telling me this and warning me. 
I better get out of here because here's the thing. They hope that this naive Galilean will, will leave Galilee and go out of the Jewish part of the protectorate, the, the place that Herod has, and go into Roman territory where Pontius Pilate is in charge. Because if Pontius Pilate has control over it, the Romans can take him, use Roman law, and anything could happen to him. The Romans just work with Roman law, and it's a completely different set of laws. Uh, they could easily do away with him. And that's really what the Pharisees are hoping for. That they can put him out of there. As long as he stays in Galilee, in Herod's uh, tetrarch part, then he's under Jewish law. And those are very strict. There are very clear things that you can be arrested and done anything. And it could happen. Certainly they did it to John the Baptist. But, uh, but he's safer. He's safer there. And Jesus knows that very shortly he will do exactly that. He will leave and he will go into Jerusalem, which will be under Roman control, and he will be arrested and then crucified. He knows he will, but not yet. Um, and that's what he's telling them. Um, so, so he tells the Pharisees, <clears throat> he offers this retort, he says, yeah, mildly but clearly, uh, he says, you tell that fox. Well, we don't think that sounds so bad. We don't think it sounds so bad. We know it's not good, but it's weird. But in Greek, um, a fox is a sly but totally unscrupulous, manipulative animal. That's what it is in Greek. And in Hebrew, a fox is an unclean animal that you would never touch or eat or have anything to do with. So in either of those cultures or languages, it's worse than we think of as a fox. That is pretty, pretty and cute. Those are some cuddles. You know? I mean, you know, we, we don't think it's so bad, but it is bad. It's a, it's a terrible thing. You tell that fox. You tell that fox uh, that I'm not going yet. I'm not going yet. And I haven't fallen for your tricks. Now, you, when Jesus does this, you it sounds like he's beginning to get up ahead of steam. You know? You tell him. I mean, you can hear him start to sound that way. And if this were modern politics, it would just be the beginning. It would just be the the opening salvo into this. If this were modern politics, it would be the warm-up, and Jesus would just be getting going. And the crowd would start to think this was great. And if it were any of the campaigns today, Jesus would be building up for some pretty hard-hitting anti-establishment rhetoric, right? Herod being the establishment, the Romans being the establishment, and the crowd would have been ready just then, just like they are now, and maybe even more. And, but that's not what happens, is it? He says what he has to say about Herod, and then he stops. He stops. And the mood changes instantly. And Jesus goes from, boom, you tell that fox, this. And then Jesus goes to characteristic of who our God is, because our God is not a God of destruction. Our God is not a God who rips everything down, tears everything up, come what may, who cares what happens. Even if it's what seems called for and what everybody wants. That's something we should be grateful for, because if our God were a God of destruction, 
We might get great pleasure from seeing Herod get his just rewards, but then we would get our just rewards. You see that? You can take great pleasure in watching someone else get what they deserve. But then you get what you deserve, and none of us are guilt-free. Not one of us. God is not a God of destruction. God is a God of salvation, whether we understand it or not. And it doesn't work like everybody else we don't like gets destruction and we get salvation. It doesn't work that way. And just when we think Jesus is getting ready to be all lightning bolts and thunder, Jesus suddenly gets a little sad and compares himself to a mother hen wanting desperately to gather chicks. Oh my gosh! How far away from lightning bolts and thunder can you get? Suddenly, Jesus uses this image for God. A mother hen? <laughs> Our God wants salvation for us, not destruction. That is the God we serve. Why is Jesus talking about chickens? Ooh, that's cool. See, Jesus is describing God's historic action. God has always longed to gather his people. Jesus has identifying himself as God. Wait, God is a chicken? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, no. God is loving. God is loving and longing to gather all people together in the safety of God's wings. That's who God is. I'm always saying the scripture passage is meant to tell us who God is and then through that who we are to be. If God, in love, is, is longing to gather all people together in love, in the safety of God's wings, then who are we to be? Something to consider. Jesus says, O oh, Jerusalem, knowing he's about to go to Jerusalem, this place with the reputation for killing prophets. And he knows that's where the end of the road will be for him. He desires to gather people. And the next slide, I just love, oh, no, Jim, you, that was the right one. That's, I just love this piece of art. It's modern, but I love modern art. It's just the sadness of Jesus' face over Jerusalem, just the feeling that is Jesus there. So this is who God wants us to be uh, as well. It's satisfying, very satisfying, to work up uh, the anger and spout off our irritations of the things that are in the newspaper. Um, our bitternesses, our disappointments, our anger, and we do this often for an appreciative listener or two. That's politics, the worst of politics, the way politics is often played out, and not very productive politics. We don't get very far when we play that kind of politics. Our Lord teaches us a different way. And in Psalm 27 that Ross beautifully read for us, we are taught to look for the light. God as the light, and to take all those fears and frustrations um, and look at them in the light of God's love, in the light of Christ's love for us. 
Psalm 27 suggests we take that newspaper and those frightening events and those solutions that politicians have for solving them that are really meant to make us happy and get them elected and evaluate them all in the light of the light that represents our faith in God. That's what will make us wise and peaceful and free. We are, according to Psalm 27, to be strong and have faith because the Lord is our salvation now and forever. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.